Mr. McCoy back with the 12th part of The Borrowers. Mrs. Driver was short with Cramferl that evening. She would not sit down and drink with him as usual, but stumped about the kitchen, looking at him sideways every now and again out of the corner of her eyes. He seemed uneasy, as indeed he was. There was a kind of menace in her silence, a hidden something which no one could ignore. Even Aunt Sophie had felt it when Mrs. Driver brought up her wine. She felt it in the clink of the decanter against the glass as Mrs. Driver set down the tray and in the rattle of the wooden rings as Mrs. Driver drew the curtains. It was in the tremble of the floorboards as Mrs. Driver crossed the room and in the click of the latch as Mrs. Driver closed the door. What's the matter with her now? Aunt Sophie wondered vaguely as delicately and greedily she poured the first glass. So based on what happened in part 11, what is wrong with Mrs. Driver now? Share with your fellow listener. The boy had felt it too, from the way Mrs. Driver had stared at him as he sat hunched in the bath, from the way she soaked the sponge and the way she said, and now she had scrubbed him slowly with a careful, angry steadiness and all through the bathing time, she did not say a word. When he was in bed, she had gone through all his things, peering into cupboards and opening his drawers. She had pulled his suitcase out from under the wardrobe and found his dear dead mole and his hoard of sugar lumps and her best potato knife. But even then, she had not spoken. She had thrown the mole into the waste paper basket and had made angry noises with her tongue. She pocketed the potato knife and all the sugar lumps. She had stared at him a moment before she turned the gas low. A strange stare it had been, more puzzled than accusing. Mrs. Driver slept above the scullery. She had her own back stairs. That night she did not undress. She set the alarm clock for midnight and put it where the tick would not disturb her, outside her door. She unbuttoned her tight shoes and crawled, grunting a little, under the eiderdown. She had barely closed her eyes, in quotation marks, as she had told Cramperl afterward, when the clock shrilled off chattering and rattling on its four thin legs on the bare boards of the passageway. Mrs. Driver tumbled herself out of bed and fumbled her way to the door. Shh, she said to the clock as she felt for the catch. Shh, and clasped it to her bosom. She stood there in her stockinged feet at the head of the scullery stairs. Something, it seemed, had flickered below. A hint of light. Mrs. Driver peered down the dark curve of the narrow stairway. Yes, there it was again, a moth wing flutter, candlelight. That's what it was, a moving candle beyond the stairs, beyond the scullery, somewhere within the kitchen. Clock in hand, Mrs. Driver creaked down the stairs in her stockinged feet, panting a little in her eagerness. There seemed a sigh in the darkness, an echo of movement. And it seemed to Mrs. Driver, standing there on the cold stone flags of the scullery, that this sound that was barely a sound could only mean one thing. The soft swing to of the green baize door, that door which led out of the kitchen into the main hall beyond. Hurriedly, Mrs. Driver felt her way into the kitchen and fumbled for matches along the ledge above the stove. She knocked off a pepper pot, a, bag, pep, a paper bag of cloves, and glancing quickly downward, saw a filament of light. She saw it in the second before she struck a match, a thread of light it looked like on the floor beside her feet. It ran in an oblong shape, outlining a rough square. Mrs. Driver gasped and lit the gas, and the room leapt up around her. She glanced quickly at the door. There seemed to her startled eye a quiver of movement in it, as though it had just swung to. She ran to it and pushed it open, but the passage beyond was still and dark. No flicker of shadow nor sound of distant footfall. She let the door fall to again and watched it as it swung back slowly, regretfully, until by its heavy spring, held by its heavy spring. But that was the sound she had heard from the scullery. That sighing whisper 
like an indrawn breath. So what's going on now with Mrs. Driver? Share with your fellow listener. Cautiously clutching back her skirts, Mrs. Driver moved toward the stove. An object lay there, something pinkish on the floor beside the jutting board. Ah, she realized, that board, that was where the light had come from. She hesitated and glanced about the kitchen. Everything else looked normal, and just as she had left it, the plates on the dresser, the saucepans on the wall, and the row of tea towels hanging symmetrically on their string above the stove, the pinkish object she saw now was a heart-shaped cashew box, one that she knew well from the glassed-in tray table beside the fireplace in the drawing room. She picked it up. It was enamel and gold and set with tiny brilliance. Well, I'm... She began and stooped swiftly with a sudden angry movement. She retched back the piece of floor and then she shrieked. Loud and long, she saw movement, a running, a scrambling, a fluttering. She heard a squeaking, a jabbering, and a gasping. Little people they looked like with hands and feet and mouths opening. That's what they looked like. But they couldn't be that, of course, running here, there, and everywhere. Oh, 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 she shrieked and felt behind her for a chair. She clambered onto it, and it wobbled beneath her, and she climbed, still shrieking, from the chair to the table. And there she stood, marooned, crying and gasping and calling out for help until, after hours it seemed, there was a rattling at the scullery door. Crampfurl it was, roused by, at last by the light and the noise. What is it? he called. Let me in. Mrs. Driver would not leave the table. A nest, a nest, she shouted, alive and squeaking. Crampful threw his weight against the door and burst open the lock. He staggered, slightly dazed, into the kitchen, his corduroy trousers pulled on over his nightshirt. Where? he cried, his eyes wide beneath his tousled hair. What sort of a nest? Mrs. Driver, sobbing still with fright, pointed at the floor. Crampfurl walked over in his slow, deliberate way and stared down. He saw a hole in the floor lined and cluttered with small objects. Children's toys they looked like. Bits of rubbish, that was all. It's nothing, he said after a moment. It's that boy. That's what it is. He stirred the contents with his foot and all the partitions fell down. There ain't nothing alive in there. But I saw them, I tell you, gasped Mrs. Driver. Little people like with hands or mice dressed up. Gramp Furl stared into the hole. Mice dressed up, he repeated uncertainly. Hundreds of them, went on Mrs. Driver, running and squeaking. I saw them, I tell you. Well, there ain't nothing there now, said Gramp Furl, and he gave a final stir round with his boot. Then they've run away she cried, under the floor, up inside the walls. The place is alive with them. Well, said Crampfurl stolidly, maybe. But if you ask me, I think it's that boy where he hides things. His eyes brightened and he went down on one knee. Where he's got the ferret, I shouldn't wonder. Listen, cried Mrs. Driver, and there was a despairing note in her voice. You've got to listen. This wasn't no boy, and it wasn't no ferret. She reached for the back of the chair and lowered herself clumsily onto the floor. She came beside him to the edge of the hole. They had hands and faces, I tell you. Look, she said, pointing. See that? It's a bed. And now I come to think of it, one of them was in it. Now you come to think of it, said Crampfurl. Yes, said, went on Mrs. Driver firmly, and there's something else I come to think of. Remember that girl, Rosa Pickatchet? The one that was simple? Well, simple or not, she saw one on the drawing room mantelpiece with a bead, with a beard. One what? asked Crampfurl. Mrs. Driver glared at him. 
what I've been telling you about. One of these, these mice dressed up, said Cram Pearl. Not mice, Mrs. Driver almost shouted. Mice don't have beards. But you said, began Cram Pearl. Yes, I know I said it. Not that these had beards, but what would you call them? What could they be but mice? Not so loud, whispered Cram Pearl. You'll wake the house up. They can't hear, said Mrs. Driver. Not through the bay's door. She went to the stove and picked up the fire tongs. And what if they do? We ain't done nothing. Move over, she went on, and let me get at that hole. So what do you think's going to happen now? Share with your fellow listener. And now a few more minutes of today's edition of The Borrowers. One by one, Mrs. Driver picked things out with many shocked gasps, cries of amazement, and did you evers. She made two piles on the floor, one of valuables and one of what she called rubbish. Curious objects dangled from the tongs. Would you believe it? Her best lace handkerchiefs. Look, here's another and another and my big mattress needle. I knew I had one, my silver thimble, if you please, and one of hers, and look, oh my, at the wools, the cottons. No wonder you can never find a spool of white cotton if you want one. Potatoes, nuts, look at this, a pot of caviar. Caviar. No, it's too much, it really is. Dolls chairs, tables, and look at all this blotting paper. So that's where it goes. Oh, my goodness gracious, she cried suddenly, her eyes staring. What's this? Mrs. Driver laid down the tongs and leaned over the hole, tentatively and fearfully as though afraid of being stung. It's a watch, an emerald watch, her watch. And she's never missed it, her voice rose. And it's going. Look, you can see by the kitchen clock. Twenty-five past twelve. Mrs. Driver sat down suddenly on a hard chair. Her eyes were staring and her face looked white and flabby as though deflated. You know what this means, she said to Crampfro. No, he said. The police, said Mrs. Driver. That's what it means. A case for the police. The boy lay trembling a little beneath the bedclothes. The screwdriver was under his mattress. He had heard the alarm clock. He had heard Mrs. Driver exclaim on the stairs, and he had run. The candle on the table beside his bed still smelled a little, and the wax must still be warm. He lay there waiting, but they did not come upstairs. After hours, it seemed, he heard the hall clock strike one. All seemed quiet now, and at last he slipped out of bed and crept along the passage to the head of the stairway. There he sat for a little while, shivering a little and gazing downward into the darkened hall. There was no sound but the steady tick of the clock, and occasionally that shuffle or whisper which might be wind, but which he knew was the sound of the house itself, the sigh of the tired floors and the ache of knotted wood. So quiet it was that at last he found courage to move and to tiptoe down the staircase and along the kitchen passage. He listened a while outside the bay's door and at length, very gently, he pushed it open. The kitchen was silent and filled with grayish darkness. He felt as Mrs. Driver had done along the shelf for the matches and he struck a light. He saw the gaping hole in the floor and the objects piled beside it, and in the same flash he saw a candle on the shelf. He lit it clumsily with trembling hands. Yes, there they lay, the contents of the little home, higgledy-piggledy on the boards and the tongs lay beside them. Mrs. Driver had carried away all she considered valuable and had left the rubbish, and rubbish it looked thrown down like this. Balls of wool, old potatoes, odd pieces of doll's furniture, matchboxes, cotton spools, crumpled squares of blotting paper. He knelt down. The house itself 
was a shambles. Partitions falling, earth floors revealed, where Pod had dug down to give greater height to the rooms, matchsticks, an old cogwheel, onion skins, scattered bottle tops. The boy stared, blinking his eyelids and tilting the candle so that the grease ran hot on his hand. We're going to find out what happens next with the borrowers as this saga continues.